I advertise it as as a 7 p.m. You know, as a sort of mechanic mechanic yeah. thing. So without yeah. Yeah. and Isotta texted me, yeah, and then I I see she 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 wrote us and it's yeah. very confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. So as soon as I see Kathleen, now I turned on the recording because I'm worried I'll forget again. Better to have more than less uh, recording. Of course. Of course. Um, so as soon as I see Kathleen, we can... Yes. Um, Oops. How are things going? Oh, it's fine. I'm just, I, I needed to rush back to my office, but I, I can be can be here for one hour. Is everything fine? Because it's also a new computer. I haven't installed everything yet, but it's great. audio, video, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, but I don't see. Yeah, and then there is another issue about two hour future events, but I will tell you not now. It's because I will have also my classes, and which finish exactly by seven p.m. on okay. Tuesdays. But we, we, I will tell you more, okay. not now. Um, uh, so right now it's six o'clock in Europe, right? Yes, it's now it's six, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I told Kathleen she should be there. Yeah. She's trying to... Do you have her uh, phone number or WhatsApp or WhatsApp? I okay. just I just texted her, but I don't want to admit anyone else before she is on. No, yeah, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're waiting, so it's fine. And also, I think given the fact that I just communicated to my potential guests like twenty minutes ago, this time change, we can take. I think. Yeah, ten minutes, you know, have, yeah, of tolerance. We have 10 people, really good crowd, but now we don't have a speaker. <laughs> <laughs> That's life. You always get what you don't need. Well, a good a good news is that today I got the official email invitation from the Getty. Oh so right. they will host us for two weeks. Oh May, May May 20 till June uh, 3rd. Oh, that's fantastic. My um I'll have another postdoc, um, Christian Ney. Do you know him? He's great. Uh, from name, on Hungary, uh, Hungarian art, Rom right? Romanian. Ah, Rom Romanian. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, but I think, I, I mean, the name sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's great. He'll be here. Um, and and you too, right? <laughs> that means you will be there. So say it again. When exactly will you be here? May 20 till June the 3rd. Yeah, no, I will be here for sure. because. Great. We're still teaching. Um, okay, I still don't see Kathleen. When did you tell? Uh, when did you tell her about this? Time shift change um, actually maybe twenty minutes ago. So she so she will need to you know. She the. Hmm. Okay, now she is joining. Great. And I cannot meet everyone else once she's there. Hello, Kathleen. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna meet, I'm gonna admit everybody else. Okay. Okay. And sorry about the mishap. Um, I had completely forgotten that there's always a two week period when. You know, there's a difference between the summertime here and not yet daylight savings time in Europe. So sorry about that. No worries. I thought I had another hour of like going through no, it again. I know I feel we bad. have to improvise. <laughs> I'm terrible about this. 
Um, all right, looks like people are joining. Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, excellent to see everyone. Let me see if maybe there's still people signing on. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. Um, I'm Sven Speaker, currently the director of the Graduate Center for Literary Research at UC Santa Barbara. And um, together um, uh, with Matteo Bertelet from the University of Venice, uh, I am co-organizing this series of lectures on GDR Art and Culture. And it's our great honor and pleasure today to welcome um, Kathleen Reinhardt. Uh, Kathleen is the director of the Georg Kolbe Museum in Berlin. Uh, from 2016 and 2022, she was the curator for contemporary art at the Albertinum in Dresden, where she organized multiple solo and group exhibitions. In 2021, she curated the group show exhibition One Million Roses for Angela Davis, and she initiated a multi-platform research and exhibition project entitled Revolutionary Romances, Transcultural Art Histories in the GDR. Kathleen is interested in the museum as an enabler of artistic research and production, the discursive quality of collections bound to a certain time uh, and historical and ideological narratives, and the engagement of feminist thought in the rethinking of art institutions. She's a scholar of African-American art and socially engaged artistic practices, and she received her PhD from the Free University in Berlin. Kathleen has also taught at various universities in Germany, and she has given lectures and workshops at art institutions and art academies worldwide. Her writing has appeared in art catalogs, scholarly volumes, as well as the magazines African Arts, Art Margins, Contemporary Art, uh, and Kaleidoscope, among many others. It's my great pleasure, Kathleen, to welcome you here. Um, we're super happy to have you, and sorry about the slight mishap with the time change. We didn't realize that in Europe, there's not yet daylight savings time, so there's now a, di a, a change time difference between Europe and California, but luckily um, we, were, we, we, we spotted it with um, um, uh, a friend's help, so everything uh, was, was safe. Thank you so much for being here, Kathleen, and the talk today is entitled, her talk today is entitled Looking Back, Moving Forward, Exhibiting Art from the GDR Today, A Sentimental Journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sven, and also thank you to Matteo for inviting me to this lecture series. Um, it's always um, really great to, to be included, to be invited also um, in the work sphere of, of Sven, speaker, of course, um, because also for me, like in his work, um, um, he's very much um, questioning also like this flattening view of, of East and Central Europe and, and in particular also of the GDR. And um, yeah, what makes this special today and uh, and also relevant um, is the special status, I think, also the GR uh, held within the socialist world, um, which brings multiple challenges, obviously. Uh, so it was, despite uh, the self-definition also as an anti-fascist state, the land of the perpetrators. At the same time, it was also the only socialist state which had a continuous direct mirror in uh, West Germany and after 89 was swallowed whole by this other somehow. And this, I think also pushed the GDR into a very different post-socialist state um, than um, can be compared, for example, with other uh, countries of the bloc. So I think and for me, this was always a guiding principle. So to work through this history today does not only mean that you should look at the, at the 40 years of the existence of the GDR, um, and, and the cultural production that happened during that time, but especially also at the past 30 years in this post-socialist state uh, where multiple generations in different capacities um, have worked through also uh, then the, the trauma inflicted somehow um, of this um, very speedy uh, reunification process. And I think it's um, really great that you started also with Angelika Richter's lecture in this series of, uh, of lectures, um, because she also probably was talking about this wide range of generations of desires um, that um, are coming together right now somehow um, through in different capacities and um, 
so independent scholars, writers, theorists, um, professors were also part or are part of, of your lecture series, um, as well as curators. And um, I think it's uh, also a very different um, position to work from within a museum. Um, because you naturally uh, inhabit also a very different position because you're in this in-between stage uh, and space somehow. So between the artwork, um, in the respective collection, uh, you have the theory and the historization, you have the artist and um, a very heterogeneous and desiring multi-generational audience um, in a very increasingly polarized uh, world, especially also in East Germany. And um, as uh, Sven has also mentioned in his introduction, I'm in a transitional phase at the moment. So I'm changing my curatorial hat uh, from a, a highly specific context, which I will speak about today, uh, for the one of director of the first newly found museum of West Berlin after the war. So I'm literally changing sides uh, here uh, to the Georg Kolbe Museum. And so um, it was, uh, or I'm, I'm also using this somehow to, um, to, yeah, to summarize my engagement of the past six years. And um, I think I will start. I want to share my screen and let's see if I'm able to do this. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, do you have to give me the permission? Yeah, I, I have now. You should be okay. Okay, so. So I hope everyone can see this. Okay, and hopefully this is also a good size somehow for everyone to see. Um, yes, so I will uh, walk you through um, uh, my exhibition projects uh, and my writing of the past years. Uh, I will do this rather swiftly and I will read quite a bit uh, because um, we don't have time and uh, usually when I start talking I cannot stop and uh, and therefore it's um, it's more of uh, a reading lecture also. So um, with this uh, it's uh, Braco Dimitrievich's work uh, from 19 from the early 1970s and this uh, also seems like a perfect opener for today. Um, the slab of marble which the Yugoslav artists engraved with the words, this could be a place of historical importance, brings with it um, the right kind of uncertainty and suspicion I found myself in when arriving in Dresden and the challenges I encountered when working in, with, and also through a highly loaded context uh, with pretensions from multiple directions. Um, the um, Albertinum is the Museum of Modern Contemporary Art of a large scale museum complex, the Dresden State Art Collections in Saxony, uh, which contains um, about 15 museums. And the Albertinum houses art from 1800 to the present and is a sort of like perfect blueprint also of a Western art museum with all its highlights and awe, as well as carrying also the many open questions which the changing Eurocentric museum world is starting to address since a few years. Um, central uh, to uh, this post-war institutional history is its location for the art exhibitions of the GDR. So these exhibitions took place between 1946 and 1988 every five years in the other and drew large crowds. This is also one of the reasons why a general audience today very much connects the Albertinum uh, to the contemporary art of that time and to what they saw in these exhibitions. The selection process for the exhibitions was steered by a professional jury in line with the official cultural politics of that time, with party officials also severely monitoring what was shown and often making changes up to the very last minute before the show opened. But only a few of the exhibited artworks uh, were eventually acquisitioned by the museum or also rather gifted. And um, I'm just using this as a pretext to understand also from what position I started my projects uh, in Dresden. In 2018, a new episode of the infamous German-German iconoclastic controversy broke loose when an East German scholar publicly accused the director of the museum, the West German Hilke Wagner, to have swiftly removed all art made in the GDR in order to establish a West German post-war canon. This wasn't the case. Uh, 
But the issue was immediately picked up by the right wing party, which is very strong in East Germany, and turned into a debate, but not about the criteria mm -hmm. which value are made in the GDR, but about the values of East German lives and the exchanges of elite after the peaceful revolution. So its repercussions um, are still felt today, obviously. So the museum did become a true space for her debate, while in the end, no real conclusion was reached. And, um, and I'm showing this uh, image of like the first opening debate um, that uh, took place uh, during also the course of a year. Um, you also, I saw also Constanze Fritsche on the list. Uh, she was also very much involved in organizing uh, this, uh, this series of events uh, where we use the museum very much as an arena uh, to bring together this, this very um, engaged but very conflicted audience also and uh, very divided audience. Um, and here you also see it, so it was uh, very much um, happening over the course of a year. An exhibition was also organized um, by Hilke Wagner and, uh, and the curator for the Art of the GR, Astrid Nielsen. Um, and I um, wrote actually an auto fiction piece uh, in the online journal Mesosphere about this, uh, where I tap into the many different issues that were raised by this intensive period for the museum like intergenerational conflict, uh, institutional history, contemporary art navigating the ruins of the GDR, and how today there are many different interpretations of the art and culture of the GDR, which are highly influenced by a slowly changing German memory culture at large. So while for the past or for about like 20 years, um, a severe condemnation of official art of the GDR was taking place. We now see a new movement aiming to bring to the fore actually, not only the overlooked artists, but also the interconnections between the first, second and third public spheres of the GDR, acting with the new, conceptual, with the new conceptual tools also of Central Eastern European art history, as well as the colonial and post-socialist sensibilities. The exhibition I organized with the collective Slavs and Tatars, made in Germany, took as its starting point German Orientalism and the paradoxical form of the tetragraph J, so the D-S-C-H in the title, which primarily introduces foreign words. In German, jungle, jihad, or Genghis Khan are written with a D-S-C-H, while equally foreign words like jeans, jogging, or gin tonic are written with a J or a G. So very much showing that this is connected to a Western context. Uh, we can use one of our letters um, to, to capture this, uh, while uh, the words uh, that are foreign in nature somehow um, are then marked by, by the tetragraph DSCH. And uh, in their artistic practice, Slavs and Tatars direct their attention towards the territory east of the Berlin Wall, which existed between 1961 and 1989, and west of the Great Wall of China, which was built in the seventh century BC. So from a cultural, historical, as well as a geographical, sociological point of view, the collective opens up a very broad and diverse field, which is used then by them also as a foil to reflect upon the interwovenness of cultures in the humanities-based fusion of philosophy, history, and philology. philology. Um, this finds form in artist books uh, on the one hand and uh, lecture performances as well as art objects in their exhibitions. So those are the three columns somehow that their artistic practice rests upon. And for me, it was interesting to see how language is examined by them, how it is processed and presented in their work as a political and effective form of communication in its objectness and as a constitutive element of power structures and history while always infusing lowbrow humor in 21st century culture. Um, I'm showing you this uh, again. So as an opener uh, for this exhibition, we chose this carpet with walking Arab scripts. So you see them having little feet um, and uh, they spell out um, Jesus, son of Mary, he is love to reference Arab also as a language of Christianity, so the walking alphabets. The mirror, you can see on the right, uh, Das Kapital Hill, was displayed on the way out. So a fusion again of 
the notion uh, um, of Capitol Hill and what that brings with it, and of course, uh, referencing the uh, Das Kapital uh, of Karl Marx. For Ruth, the sky in Los Angeles is an aquarelle that consists only of this sentence, which LA-based artist David Horvitz sent to the retired typewriting and mail art artist Rudolf Riefeld in 2016. The exhibition was conceptualized as a sort of living homage to an overlooked position of mail art and visual poetry. So Rudolf Riefeld was born in 1932 in Saxony, and in the GDR, she was active as an artist from the beginning of the 1970s until the 1990s. Using an Erika typewriter, she developed complex graphic compositions, juxtaposing text and image in her timeless typewritings, so diagrams, patterns, abstract poetry, and collages. Although Wolf Riefeld worked in East Berlin and therefore was subject to travel restrictions and strongly surveilled communication, she was an active member of the international mail art movement and corresponded with artists in Europe, the United States, South America, and Asia. Her work can therefore also be found in many archives of international mail art artists around the world. And um, I also saw Zana Gilbert on the lecture lecture list, so she, um, in her lecture coming up in a few weeks, will certainly go much deeper in um, also the resonances male art held uh, for, for the Riefelds, so Ruth was also working with her husband, Robert Riefeld, um, and, uh, and of course the East German male art scene. The exhibition, which just ended um, its second stop at the Vendee Museum of the Cold War in Culver City, was an experiment in which the neo-fluxus artist David Horvitz entered into a dialogue with Wolf Riefeld's work. Horvitz, in his, of, in his work, often deals with processes of circulation and interconnectedness, exploring how through thoughts and feelings, uh, how th thoughts and feelings become signs and actions. Whether with mail art, artist books, infiltrations on the internet, apps, or documented travels and collected artifacts, the questioning of the rules of time and space, knowledge, and ownership mark his artistic approach. And I'm just showing a few of the images here uh, from, from the exhibition in Dresden. There's also a publication um, that I was very lucky Sven contributed to here. Um, and it is more, much more of an artist book where this exchange also is then translated uh, in, into publication format. Um, this exhibition, um, uh, of, this was like a part of a, of a series um, that we did at the Albertine, which focuses also uh, the collection works and puts them um, in focus, obviously. Um, it was titled, Nach meiner Kenntnis ist das sofort unverzüglich. The infamous uh, sentence actually that um, was uh, iterated on uh, national television um, in November 1989, which actually then triggered uh, the events that came after. So the, the, the opening, the physical opening of the wall uh, was very much connected to, uh, to this sentence, uh, which could be translated with, uh, as far as I know, effective immediately without delay. And in this collection presentation, um, which happened on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the Peaceful Revolution, Zika Wagler, the curator of the Kunstfonds, and I teamed up to show three works. The first was Via Lewandowski's Swaying Pictures, which you can see on the right, with its two sides. You can only see one side now. It was entitled Frozen Limbs Break Easily and Greeting. The work dates back to 1988-89. So while Frozen Limbs Break Easily was created in 1988 in East Berlin, the other side, which you can see entitled Greeting, was painted in 1989 in West Berlin, where the artist was staying at the time of the fall of the wall. The second work, um, which you can see is still off in the middle, was Henrike Naumann's video work and installation entitled Triangular Stories, created in 2012. The artist, who was born in 1984, stages scenes from the 1990, from 1990s youth culture in West and East, between terror and amnesia. Through two films that give the impression of being home videos, but are actually performed by actors, the viewer is introduced to the world of teenagers living in 1992. Naumann modeled a group of actors after the terrorist group NSU, NSU 
which existed unnoticed in Spikau, developing its right-wing extremist plans of murders close to the place of the artist's own childhood. And then after 1990, which Nauman calls the last summer of innocence, putting these plans into action all over Germany in a murderous spree against foreigners. The third work, which you can see on the lower left, was a nine hour video work by Mario Pfeiffer, who was born in 1981. In this work, in this 2016 work, the Dresden born artist shows interview material of various people without any commentary or evaluation. The nine one on one interviews reflect a range of individual forms of political and social engagement, consider personal experiences immediately before and after the peaceful revolution and expressed the irritation and disorientation associated with the Wende and the reunification of Germany, which is still felt to this, to this day. The aim of the project with the deliberately uncomfortable title on fear and education, disappointment and justice, protest and division in Saxony, Germany, was not only to portray the debate on points of social conflict, but also to give space to the interviewee's experiences, fears, and hopes for the future. One Million Roses for Angela Davis was the title of an exhibition I organized at the Albertinum in 2020-21. Bad timing, one could say. It borrows its title from the postcard campaign of the large scale solidarity action that the GDR orchestrated in 1971-72. Over the period of one year, millions of these cards were sent from East Germany and flooded the mailing system of the court in California that was putting Conrad Angela Davis on trial. The GDR at that time was still fighting for recognition as a sovereign state and a campaign of this size easily put it on the world map that was mirrored for, uh, that was mined for it through the Holstein doctrine. But it was also an instrument to reach the state's youth. This was the first generation that was born into a highly controlling state socialism, differentiating themselves from the construction generation that was strongly guided by communist values after World War II. In internal communiques of the GDR's political apparatus, one can trace how Davis was built up as a media personality with which the GDR aimed to create a pop star-like phenomenon for doubting youth, a charismatic black American Marxist officially holding a CP membership who, as a political philosopher, was also fluent in German. In the US, Davis and her legal team eventually exposed the racist jurisdiction jurisdictional system after one year of trial. And after her release, she went on a thank you tour for the engaging support throughout the socialist bloc to which she returned again and again in the following years. I'm showing some of the historical images here um, which, um, which show Angela Davis uh, at the age of 27 um, and 28 uh, on the right image um, touring the, the communist bloc uh, the image on the right was uh, was taken in seventy three during the World uh, Games of uh, of Youth uh, that uh, were staged in East Germany. So she is part of the elite. She is invited here towards uh, on stage uh, to show um, a very uh, broad uh, image. Then also, obviously, of um, of the GDR. In the GDR, she was welcomed as a state guest, graced the covers of magazines, was portrayed in oil by the highest ranks of artists and bestowed with the great star of the friendship of nations, while masses flocked to her public appear appearances. Others remained silent, suspicious of the Anglomania that swept East Germany. The campaign was state run after all and therefore could not be trusted. And here um, is, a, is a series of, of paintings uh, that were made by, um, by GDR artists uh, of Angela Davis during that time. So um, they're all dated uh, 1970, 71, 72. Mistrust in the GDR's propaganda machine bestowed the name and image of Angela Davis with skepticism on the one hand, 
but on the other, a high emotional identification occurred with her as an integral part of GDR culture and remembrance. The exhibition, One Million Roses for Angela Davis in Dresden, was situated between these highly emotional in my, or this highly emotional in mind field of fractured remembrance, tainted archives, and the East Germany of today, where more than one third of the population are protest voting for a populist party with fascist politics. The revenge this party is offering is constructed around the East feeling of betrayal brought upon them by the West German high-speed reunification process of neoliberal nature in the early 1990s and fear-mongering of anyone foreign and not belonging to white Germany. In reiterating the Solidarity Action's title, One Million Roses for Angela Davis, the exhibition is using the semantic, poetic, and emotional associations that come with it to disturb this construction and ask about the missed po uh, possibilities, the presence and status of Davis and the GDR should have triggered and its repercussions today. I aimed at inserting a corrective to reflect on national trauma, intergenerational dialogue, and racist socialization. But at the same time, I also wanted obviously to revisit Angela Davis' Black Feminist Marxist project through contemporary artworks. I wanted to connect this constructed iconized Angela Davis of the GDR with the political philosopher of a young generation that a young generation keeps returning to today. The exhibition opened this thinking between the posts of post-colonialism and post-socialism with the Center for Unfinished Business by the online platform on art from an African perspective, Contemporary End, which you can see on the left. And the video work Intervista by Albanian artist Anrizala, which you can see on the right. Contemporary End are offering a speculative library constellation here with a focus on Davis' work as a scholar. And Rizala, throughout his graduation film, traces his own family history of confronting his mother with film footage he found of her as a young woman speaking during a Congress of the Albanian Socialist Party. So the notion of offering one million roses then has multiple balances and is used in the exhibition to explore a complex and bittersweet web of relationships grouped around a structure holding archival remnants and historical information. And you can see this on the left, it was a um, sort of opaque structure that was holding a timeline, was also um, holding vitrines with historical materials uh, from the GDR, and, um, and was basically inserted also then uh, into the presentation of contemporary art. On the right, you see a work by the American artist Sadie Barnett. She presented six images on a black wallpapered background covered with classified stamps. Her father was a member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and for some time also a bodyguard to Angela Davis and therefore has a very impressive file of civilians. Through acts of violating these papers of the infamous counterintelligence program with pink spray paint, the artist now reclaims this history. What also drew me to the artworks in the show was their highly different forms identif uh, of identification with and articulation of what now appears to be the lost alternatives. And here you can also, this is a view inside of the vitrines um, and, uh, and the postcards. We were also offering um, reading material to, to the audience, um, which and that was the sideline also of the exhibition um, because we used, uh, we used it also to establish um, an anti-racist um, educational program. And uh, and the top, you can see also um, a collage of, of those postcards that were sent uh, to, to the US from, from the GDR. And um, I contrasted this uh, with two letters uh, that were written to Angela Davis, so official letters that were published uh, in newspapers. One was by a Czech dissident, 
um, claiming or calling Comrade Angela Davis also to look uh, at the atrocities that communist states were doing towards their own citizens. And on the other hand, I was uh, showing the, the open letter that uh, James Baldwin wrote uh, to um, his sister Angela. It's called my sister, to my sister Angela. So again, navigating, trying to navigate between those two poles. American sculptor Melvin Edwards' work for Samoa Michelle, shown on the left, so this uh, metal sculpture you can see, um, was in conversation with Kavani Kivanga's Flowers for Africa, which you can see on the lower right. A multi-part project where the exhibiting institution recreates flower arrangements on the basis of protocols the artist created from archival photographs of the independence declarations of African states. Throughout the, uh, throughout the exhibition, these wilts, like the dreams of these decolonial movements. So in the exhibition uh, were displayed the bouquets of Algeria, Namibia, and Mozambique. So all nations that also have a socialist history and stood in relation to the GDR, uh, GDR's foreign policy initiatives. Completing this triangle, um, which I, I called the Triangle of Mozambique, um, is um, or was a new commission uh, by the artist uh, Angela Ferreira. So this big machine that you see in the middle um, here. Her video sculpture is based upon the form of an industrial printing press fabricated in the GDR. In the video, and um, you, you cannot see the video, but um, so there's the printing press and there's also a screen and a projection, um, which you can see. Um, so there's two stools uh, and, and you, you could sit on them to watch the video. Um, so in uh, so the video sculpture is based upon the form of an industrial printing press fabricated in the GDR. In the video, the artist weaves together footage of Angela Davis giving an online teaching at the height of the 2020 Black Lives Matters uprisings, a young Portuguese actor reading the poetry of Noema de Sousa, the mother of Mozambican poetry, in front of Lisbon's monument of Carlos I, and a young Davis speaking about Paul Robeson on her visit to East Berlin in Germany. Paul Robeson, like Davis, was also um, a socialist hero and uh, a hero in the GDR of the other America. The installation Bautzner Straße, uh, Bautzner Street by Nassantour, you see on the upper left. The artist photographed the cell doors of the former remnant prison of the GDR's secret police and installed them in a room with the exact size of a prison cell. Angela Davis' prison abol abolitionist engagement was in the ex exhibition exchange for an emphasis on the psychological warfare the GDR discreetly and highly precisely raged against its own citizens, if their interpretation of socialism deviated from the official party line. On the right, you can see a still from Gabriele Stötze's Cell 5, where the artist activist revisits her former cell in 1991 for a performance of prison life's pressures to come to terms with the period in her life which radicalized her and which laid the foundation for her alternative approach to feminist thinking and art making. Stötze's recovery of her history through the restaging of her trauma might be mirrored then by Sadie Barnett's reappropriation of her father's FBI files. There's much more about the files, um, but maybe we have uh, some more time at the end uh, to, to discuss this because Gabriele Stötze was also instrumental actually as an activist uh, in 89-90 to save the, the GDR's secret police files from being destroyed. Um, so. Um, so the absurdity of contributing to free Angela Davis from prison, while at the same time putting its own citizens in prison based on an intricate system of spies, is central to understanding the unstable ground the show operates from. Sophie Kahl's the, the Detachment, which you can see on the left, 
is a series of two-part works which pair photographic images of removed symbols of socialism from public spaces with the speculative accounts of passers-by the artist approached who were asked to remember what these symbols looked like and what their meaning was. I paired this with historical paintings by Davis and painters from the GDR. There's some impressions also from, from the exhibition. So um, I, I showed um, a series of letters that were written to Angela Davis uh, in prison, um, which very much show uh, the, the different nation, uh, nature also of, um, of those letters. Some are highly official. Um, they uh, were written by uh, collectives also uh, from factory workers. Um, others were accounts of teenage girls um, very much identifying with the fight of Angela Davis and wanting to become like her. Um, others were old communists um, um, who, who lived also uh, through uh, World War II, who were um, making a connection somehow uh, towards uh, from of their struggle towards the struggle that Angela Davis was going uh, through towards that time. And I was showing uh, here the flags um, of Stundelat, uh, also a collective, St. Petersburg, um, and uh, the flag in the middle, the large flag, uh, shows, uh, for example, Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator um, who was um, who was instrumental actually in uh, developing also an education from below. Um, and uh, above, uh, you can see a stitching um, which uh, which reads, uh, schooling me softly with your tongues. Um, also, again, this like missed moment of re-education um, here. Uh, I was also able to show uh, Arthur Jaffar's uh, work, uh, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, um, very impressive one channel video installation. Um, and here, um, Julie Maretto's uh, abstract painting, Manifestation, which you can see on the left, set a tone for a conversation between works by Julia Phillips with the short black and white film of a headless body stomping a ground of clay. Senga Ningudi's performance photograph on the lower left um, was placed next to a rare underground artist book uh, from the late GDR with illustrations by Petra Schramm and words by Afro-German poet Raya Lubinetsky. Um, and here you see the installation of uh, Elske Rosenfels hugging Angela Davis. And this work was a commission, uh, was a commissioned two-channel video installation by Eske Rosenfeld, who retraces and reperforms the story behind a historic photograph that shows a breach of protocol in more than one sense. The image was made when Angela Davis, during a wrath-laying ceremony for the victims of fascism in East Berlin, turned around to the crowd and hugged a young woman. This young woman turned out to be Erika Berthold, was part of a group of young dissident activists who campaigned for socialism with the human face and was only protected from persecution through family ties to the party's elite. In her restaging of this touch, or better, almost touch, because the photograph, there's a photograph and a very small snippet uh, of, uh, of a film where you can see that they want to hug, but you don't see the, the hug actually executed. Um, so she, in the video work then, uh, Eske Rosenfeld tries to restage this hug and narrates uh, the story um, uh, along the way. And this was also part of, uh, of Rosenfeld's uh, continue, um, continuous work uh, on a project um, which was called A Vocabulary of Revolutionary Gestures, uh, where she researches bodily archives uh, for underrecognized alliances in search of a radical solidarity. One Space combined the video Three Songs About Liberation by Colleen Smith with works by Charles White. White, now hailed as the patron saint of the Black LA art scene of the 1960s and 70s, was indeed a corresponding member of the Academy of Arts in East Berlin and was exhibited on several occasions in the GDR. So on the lower right hand corner, you can see him in Dresden on his visit to the art exhibition of the GDR in the Albertinum in 1978. 
And um, I've talked about Charles White uh, and other um, African-American artists in the GDR um, uh, at length, uh, actually, um, in, a shared, uh, in a shared lecture with Julia Bailey, uh, which we presented during the conference Into the Cold. And you can find this also um, on YouTube through uh, the other Tinums or the State Collections um, website and YouTube channel if you should be interested in this. There's also a catalog which um, also combines a lot of writing uh, on Angela Davis in the GDR, an interview with her uh, now, and uh, and of course is looking at all of the artworks um, in detail. And I will come to an end um, with uh, the very short introduction of a project, uh, which is a longer term project. Um, and I uh, put here the years 2020 to 24, um, it's a research project that I initiated and started um, at the Albertinum and which is now uh, continued by my colleague uh, Matthias Wagner. Um, so I'm concluding with this. Um, so read uh, through rarely shown works of the vast collections of the Dresden State Art Collections. The project Revolutionary Romances, Transcultural Art Histories in the GDR, which grew out of the One Million Roses research focuses on the cultural relationships between the GDR and the socialist-oriented countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. This multi-year and multi-platform research and exhibition project takes as its starting point the many entangled art histories of decentralized exchange, the multiple unexplored connections between the GDR and communist countries of what today is termed the Global South were cultivated by exchange programs and institutional exhibition and the collecting practices that were facilitated and perpetuated by the GDR's politicizing official art system. And in a research exhibition, um, I realized uh, last year with my follow, uh, former colleague, uh, Matthias Wagner, who's continuing this project, we showed a first glimpse um, uh, into this very wide cosmos uh, that also the, the collections uh, in Dresden hold. So the show looked at historical artworks, um, this research, this first research show looked at historical artworks, like the portrait of South African singer Miriam Makeba, uh, which you can see on the left, by a relatively unknown artist from the GDR, for example, but it also tested interventions um, of contemporary artists, by contemporary artists in the collection presentation. Uh, Sung Kyu, for example, um, an artist whose parents were part of the Vietnamese contract worker uh, workforce and who grew up in East Germany in Berlin in the 1990s, showed the oppressive contracts, which you can see um, on the lower left, um, the Vietnamese workers had to sign in the GDR alongside a good they manufactured in a people's owned factory in Dresden. And we showed this uh, in the collection presentation, uh, in which also a work referring to the pogroms of the early 1990s in Rostock Lichtenhagen and Hoyerswerda, where especially um, Vietnamese people were attacked, um, hangs, um, and uh, which is by, by the artist Katharina Sieverding, which you can see uh, in, the, in the picture uh, on, on the left, uh, on the upper left, uh, the, the right uh, black and white uh, Deutschland with Deutsche. Um, image. Um, another um, intervention with, uh, was by Laura Horelli, um, and it was a film about the revolutionary magazine Namibia Today, uh, which was published by the exiled SWAPO, uh, so the Southwest African um, People's Organization, which was fighting for the independence of Namibia. Um, and uh, so this uh, this magazine was basically uh, financed and published and printed um, in the GDR and then transported back uh, to Namibia. In June uh, 20, uh, 2020, we teamed up also with the university, with Kerstin Schankweiler at the Technical University in Dresden uh, to host a three-day symposium on the global GDR uh, that focused exclusively on the relations uh, from and to the GDR. And with the Into the Cold uh, conference that uh, I already mentioned last October, we were able to widen this substantially. So to include also practices and particularities across the block uh, and their respective approaches. 
And um, so this is just a, a small summary um, also of the different platforms that this project, which is a research project, uh, operates upon. And the final um, exhibition, which will be the concluding um, presentation also of this uh, multi-year research, um, is curated by uh, Matthias Wagner and is scheduled to open in November of this year. And um, so it will bring very much together um, many different aspects and also problematics, obviously, uh, that this research holds, um, but is also thought as a model also how to um, revisit collections and how to revisit um, also works in collections that are rarely shown or uh, not shown at all uh, because of their very specific context. Um, and I think I will stop here. I hopefully clocked <laughs> in, uh, well, um, but uh, I hope this gave you um, a little overview also of the work um, that I've been engaged uh, with uh, of the past uh, years, uh, and especially the Revolutionary Romances project, um, which is ongoing and uh, which will come uh, to a conclusion at the end of this year. Okay. And I'm open for questions, I guess. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kathleen, for this exciting um, walk through your multifaceted work and projects. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure there are comments or questions. So anybody, please go ahead, raise your hand or not. Um, for the moment, it doesn't seem like there are too many people competing. Any questions or comments, please go ahead. It. Thank you so much for a really rich talk and for sharing some of this curatorial and uh, and 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 uh, kind of exhibition practice work that you've been doing. I, I'm really compelled by your arrangements and hangings, and and I'm really thankful to learn about them. I wonder if I recognize an interest um, in the context of your placing into dialogue kind of pre and post 1989 works so that there really is not this hard stop, this assumption of an unbridgeable gap between so socialism and the present. Whether you see GDR art moving toward becoming a kind of archive that contemporary artists can directly draw upon in, in their work. Um, I have, have worked on the uh, Lutz Dambeck for whom in the GDR era, one of the things he was most interested in doing was taking fragments of Weimar era cinema and the Nazi cinema and incorporating them into both experimental films and performance practices, sort of drawing upon um, previous eras, artworks and uh, as kind of archives for the continuing production of kind of meta-historical uh, artistic work. And I wonder if you see, um, emerging a kind of set of practices by contemporary artists where GDR era practices or even works themselves can be drawn on. That seemed to be what you were saying. Uh, her work is now doing, right? Opening up new dialogues. But I wonder if you could comment on that aspect. Um, yeah, th thank you for the question. And um, actually, the uh, so, so Lutz Dambeck was also part um, of the research exhibition of revolutionary romances uh, with the work uh, on paper where he um, juxtaposed uh, an image uh, from that was taken from his studio. Um, actually in Leipzig uh, in the 70s and um, and he juxtaposed it or overlaid it uh, with uh, press images uh, from Chile. Uh, and the coup d'etat in Chile and uh, and the time thereafter. So also here, let's Dambek was bringing together different um, times and places uh, and uh, and was merging them also um, in um, in his uh, in his work. And this is also something, and I hope that that leads somehow um, or segues into into your question. Um, what I also did um, in, in the One Million Roses um, exhibition and also with uh, the Revolutionary Romances project is uh, to also create a space um, in 
in exhibition format where um, practices of artists who uh, were part of the official uh, canon and the official system um, can equally comment on a situation um, as uh, artists like Gabriele Stötzer or Lutz Dambeck, who were part more of, uh, of a different um, different art world in, in the GDR, um, not part necessarily of this very official system. So uh, to have Gabriele Stötzer and Willi Sitte in the same exhibition um, on Angela Davis, uh, of course, was a stretch, um, but, uh, but it worked, uh, I think, um, because the juxtapositions uh, in these exhibitions were um, so radical somehow. Um, and, and to bring them uh, in conversation about um, maybe also a shared concern and about this lost utopia um, that uh, I wanted uh, also again to, to show. So um, also the titles of the exhibitions very much carry this with them. So you have this like very romantic notion of something that's gone and that you want back. And um, but I think, um, and this is coming to your question now, Seth, um, is that uh, artists, contemporary artists, young contemporary artists uh, from who, who have a GDR history uh, uh, in their families or grew up in East Germany um, at the moment are um, much more concerned also with, uh, with the right wing uh, craziness that's going on there. Um, then to to dig out um, East German or, or or GDR artworks um, to to recycle somehow. So um, and I mentioned that at the beginning. So so to look at those forty years of GDR um, history and then but then also to look at the thirty years after, uh, which basically brought of age also artists um, who are now in in their early forties um, uh, who have lived throughout uh, the, the 1990s uh, when everything changed uh, while, um, so you, you have this like mourning somehow of something that's lost um, at the same time, um, the, the, the right wing was such a strong presence uh, in, in East Germany today um, that uh, you're not concerned so much with, uh, with other things somehow because, uh, because this is like the pressing issue that uh, you want to address and that you also feel responsible for in a way yeah to to bring uh into into a public discourse and i think this is also what we've been seeing um in actually only the past three years um that this is an issue and that other voices also uh from from the gdr finally eventually also uh, find a stage uh, and find find a public uh in literature in music uh so this is the generation um growing up throughout the 90s, uh, sometimes throughout the 80s, um, and maybe being being the an other in the GDR, uh, being Afro-German. Uh, and in the GDR, this also meant something completely different than uh, in West Germany, obviously. Um, so this is all part, I think, of uh, of, of somehow a movement to, to push uh, this GDR history into, into the German present. Um, and 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 somehow get uh, the the problematics out of this, and what this means also in uh, a self definition of, of of what Germany is uh, today, um, and uh, and and so the the practices, and and probably this was also what your your question was like gearing um, towards uh, a little bit was uh, obviously uh, there is um, also an urge to historicize those uh, those works only so to to put a break uh, um, uh, around them so um, and this is the problem also that uh, that many contemporary uh, or that also the, this generation has, which was active in uh, the GDR in the 80s, and then uh, is obviously still producing work today, uh, that uh, now uh, the, the interest falls only into the work that was produced until 1990. Um, and, uh, and, and this this is also um, uh, a huge problematic that was also discussed, obviously, uh, during this, uh, this series of of, uh, of lectures, of uh, conversations that uh, Constanze Fitcher and, and Astrid Nielsen uh, organized in, uh, in the Albertinum. Um, there's no conclusion, obviously, uh, to, to this, uh, but uh, yeah, so just to, I hope I've just put some impulse. Right. 
<laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Um, we, we need to be a little bit mindful of time. We try to limit ourselves to one hour strictly. So I'd like to bundle the two next uh, questions and please answer them briefly if possible. Um, it's uh, Iman and also then Constanza afterwards. Please go ahead, Iman. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture, Dr. Reinhardt. Um, it's been very stimulating and important work. And I was so excited to see that you were coming to lecture on Zoom because I actually went to your exhibition this summer, um, the prologue exhibition. So I have this candy by my side. Oh, right. <laughs> and I was wondering just at your critical point that you talked about being in this position as a curator, working between research and theories and being mindful of an audience. I was wondering if you could shed a bit of light on your experiences through kind of organizing this introductory prologue, as you say, that is extending, like how do you negotiate with the fact that a kind of introduction or survey is inherently expansive, but also will naturally have to exclude a lot as well. How did, how did you negotiate your own process to figure out what, what to include for this prologue intro, introduction and, and what kind of challenges came up with that too? And perhaps different conceptions of like what revolutionary means and, and just the expansiveness that that can bring moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Thanks so much. Constanza, please go ahead. We cannot hear um, you. Oh, yeah. um, do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. Um, so I just have a brief question. As you know, um, in, in the discourse of Eastern European art, to make it brief, there is a big discussion if and how we should make use of um, post-colonial studies approach. And as you are dealing with all those relations between GDR and the global South, and also you are working on this entangled art histories, I was wondering, what is your um, perspective on using this post-colonial uh, discourses and post-colonial methods within yeah, the discourse of Eastern European art. Yes, to make it short. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, two, two questions that I need actually very long answers, but I try to summarize this. I'm jumping into um, Constance's question. Um, I, um, I I'm I'm working actually with overlays, so so it's it's um, it's always looking um, also um, at the GDR as uh, or East Germany um, addressing those issues as a sort of latecomer uh, to to the Central Eastern Europe um, also discourse uh, somehow um, also. Everything so there has been done so much um, also uh, on that field in the in the past twenty five years um, uh, thirty years, and uh, and I think um, the the East German discourse um, was um, always looking for for a language uh, which was modeled then especially in the nineties uh, and two thousand. Um, a lot towards uh, a West German discourse. So here again, you have this other, this eternal other. So um, again, um, uh, Germany and, and and East German scholars were not looking east; they were looking west. Um, so so this is only something that comes up now uh, when East Germany all of a sudden is included <laughs> in uh, in in the surveys uh, in survey exhibitions about um, uh, the Eastern Bloc in um, in publications. So this is also something fairly new, um, as you also know very well, um, and and that's why we we are still figuring out how to use the tools that we have more or less i mean my own uh, scholarly background and and uh, Dresden, uh, and uh, Sven mentioned that at the beginning is uh, african american studies and black studies um so th this is the backpack i basically walked into the albertino with uh, and uh, and then uh, was of course uh, yeah uh, trying to figure out uh, how to deal um with this in this hyper white uh, art institution uh, in a way um, and uh, I want to make it short, so uh, I'm I'm picking up the the question of Iman, and uh, Iman uh, saw uh, the the Albertina. She was there, so she she, she knows that uh, or, or saw also that this is a, a very a specific um, also context because it is this like jewel box of a museum somehow, and um, and so um, I so so for me it. 
I mean, curating is always uh, necessarily uh, has to do with uh, with the selection and uh, with inclusion and exclusion. And uh, what, uh, but and I mentioned this uh, in in my answer to to Seth uh, was also we we very much try to show. Um, not, we cannot show all sides, but we try to show um, also multiple sides to this. So this research exhibition was very much guided also by a non-judgmental. Uh, approach. So we showed, we described, but we didn't value, or we didn't judge, or we didn't problematize also um, the the many issues and the many conflicting issues that this topic actually holds also. So I've not talked about also um, uh, racism and uh, the very specific form of racism, um, obviously, uh, in, in Germany being, um, being so, uh, socialized also uh, in uh, in a racist way, um, but um, and this of course maybe uh, is also something that uh, somehow connects back to to Constance's uh, question uh, because we saw this also um, implode uh, at uh, at the um, throughout the discussions of last year's documenta basically so that was the perfect model case also of uh, this inability. Um, of Germany somehow to bring those two ends together of a decolonial uh, sensibility and uh, and a post uh, and a post socialist or a German idea also what uh, a memory culture and a very specific memory culture uh, is supposed to be and so um, with this with the research exhibition um, it was very broad it was uh, organized also uh, in regions and for regions and uh, with the with the larger exhibition that Matthias is working on right now it is uh, much more thematic so we are looking at icons we are looking at different uh, themes uh, here and thematics uh, that arise uh, in uh, through the artworks but um, what is also, and and I think this is um, this is maybe a challenge, and uh, I will come to to an end uh, with this. Also, is that um, of course the context and um, and the writing and uh, and 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 uh, describing and description also um, about uh, the about the context is actually sometimes uh, maybe also taking over. Uh, the the place of the artworks and uh, and this is something that uh, that in in Dresden we are very um, or that we were um, like very very uh, keen on uh, somehow um, finding a balance uh, between this so to create a space where uh, where we look at those contexts and where we can uh, think about certain things through the artwork and not use the artwork uh, as an illustration or just show a research. Um, so, um, because it is easy to be drawn into this direction because so many photo documents, uh, fantastic photo documents exist from that period um, that uh, you only want to describe what was going on. And, uh, and you hit this uh, during, during my talk uh, that I also needed a very long introduction to somehow uh, summarize also the situation uh, that Angela Davis then was iconized uh, within this context. And, um, and so this, um, this balance uh, between uh, showing those artworks and making them shine as well, because so many of those artworks uh, were not shown and uh, for a long, long time. And to show them again, uh, to use them um, as part of, uh, of a very vibrant working with the collection um, is also something else um, than to, to for example, create an exhibition around the context uh, and about contemporary artworks dealing with this context, then to actually work with those artworks and to also take those artworks serious in uh, in their status as artworks and in the intention that uh, that these artists had at that time. Um, so it, it's always a back and forth, I would say. Yeah. Okay. We have time for one more brief comment or question, if anyone has one. I have maybe just out of curiosity, a question about, about a Angela Davis exhibition, because I've heard so much actually, also with, from different people, but I wanted to know, yeah, a little bit more about the, the reception of the exhibition, because you are touching upon a team that I think also is, is, 
tied to the memory of many visitors, perhaps also in different ways with different approaches. So if you just can give us a short insight into the different receptions and reactions that the show arise. Yeah, um, yeah. I, um, I I briefly touched upon this. Uh, so the original opening date was the first of May, twenty twenty. Um, so uh, not a good date yeah. to mm -hmm. open, obviously. Um, and then um, this happened actually to the rest of the exhibition. So we pushed it into November. Um, it was open. It was open for three weeks and then it was closed. So it was like this eternal lockdown and. Mm. Um, this um, extension of lockdowns, uh, of cultural lockdowns, you have to also say, um, in, in Saxony in particular. So while the cafe and Ikea were open, um, museums were closed because of the dangerous nature um, of, of museums. And, uh, and so that was um, uh, uh, obviously a, a large drawback uh, also to, um, to, to find out like a really, um, or to, to receive like a larger scale um, audience uh, reaction. So from uh, what we could record uh, in, in the visitor book um, during that time, and also in uh, personal conversations was um, of course this uncanniness that this brings with it. So, um, and that was also my original impulse also why doing this exhibition. So uh, you mentioned the name Angela Davis um, to um, anyone who's older than uh, 55 uh, in the GDR and everyone knows her. Um, so, and, and of course we have like a very strong bodily reaction. So the lights, the eyes shine, people are open. So you have this first like, <gasps> Angela Davis. Um, and then in the second step, you have a self-correction. So there's always this Angela Davis and then mm, was she part of the system? So people don't know how to navigate this. And this was also how I wanted this exhibition to work. Um, so to draw people in, to draw them in with all of their doubt and then to show them all also what has happened, what are the missed opportunities, but especially what Angela Davis means to contemporary artists today. Um, and this continuation somehow of, of her story and of her history. Um, and, um, and so we, we could see uh, from, from, from the visitors books and uh, from, from the reaction uh, that this actually worked. So um, people were writing, I came here, I didn't know, I only knew the name Angela Davis, uh, and then this opened up to me. So, and, uh, so, and so this was exactly actually what I wanted to do uh, somehow. Or um, I was also speaking to, um, to a curator, uh, Susanna Altmann, um, who's also uh, a theorist and a writer, uh, in, uh, in, established uh, writer and curator in the field of uh, the art of the GDR. And uh, she was uh, telling me, of course, everyone came then with their childhood stories uh, of Angela Davis. And so she told me also, she was not allowed to have um, a pin uh, with Angela Davis uh, from the side of her parents. So they said, no, this is complete brainwash again. Um, so you, you, you cannot have this. So for her also, this name was flawed right uh, at the beginning. And then of course, uh, also through this exhibition, she's like, okay, this is opening up now to me. It has so many different puzzle pieces that I can place together, I guess, in a different way now uh, through bringing exactly this um, together, those uh, two sides. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um... Yeah, many thanks again for being here uh, for this uh, super inspiring talk and the discussion afterwards. Um, it was a great pleasure. And I'd like to thank everyone for having been here and for having followed our series. Um, please uh, call again uh, in two weeks. We'll have our next guest. Thank you again, everyone, and particularly Kathleen for, um, for being here for us. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank having you. me. It was, it was really great. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.